Good afternoon, everyone. Are we ready? Did we find parking? Are we sitting down? I would like to welcome you to the 38th Annual Northern California Book Awards. My name is Kai Milner. I'm an author and a columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle. The Northern California Book Reviewers is a volunteer association whose members review books for local, regional, and national publications. They obviously review books that are written by authors from Northern California, like us. The book awards are presented by Poetry Flash, the San Francisco Public Library, and Friends of the San Francisco Public Library, Penn West, the Mechanics Institute Library, and the Women's National Book Association, San Francisco Chapter. After the awards, you're invited to join us immediately after the ceremony for a reception and a book signing in the Latino Hispanic Meeting Room. This room is across the lobby on this floor. All books that we're going to mention today are going to be available for you to buy and to have signed by the authors who are here. Each year, the National California Book Reviewers read and discuss hundreds of titles. They sort through piles of books to find the best from Northern California authors. The books that are considered this year were published in 2018. And today we're going to celebrate all of the nominees and all of the books showcased here. So make sure you have your phones, you know, your little notes app, or if you use a, note if you use a notebook, make sure you write down some of these names because this is your reading list, at least until next year. So the first award is the uh, Northern California Book Awards Recognition Award for a literary figure or project. And um, I'm going to introduce Northern California Book Awards member uh, Joyce Jenkins to present this award, if you'd like to come to the podium. Hi there. Well, first I'd like to thank NCBR members Jonah Raskin and David Roderick, who wrote book reviews for John McMurtry. They provided the inspiration to make this NCBR Recognition Award a reality. For 11 busy years, 2008 to 2019, John McMurtry played a vital role in the literary life of the San Francisco Bay Area. As the San Francisco Chronicle books editor, he practiced and extended a tradition of reviewing that was nurtured and sustained by previous Chronicle book editors, such as Pat Holt, Alex Madrigal, Oscar Villalon, and David Kippen. McMurtry reviewed books every Sunday, enlisted local reviewers, and reported on the Bay Area literary community. He traced the hustle and bustle of the publishing industry, interviewed dozens of authors, including Tom Wolfe, and wrote memorable obituaries of literary legends such as Robert Stone. McMurtry created and published a stunning literary map of San Francisco with famous and not so famous writers, including Gus Lee, Ishmael Reed, and Isabel Allende, along with quotations from authors like Maya Angelou, who said, I became intoxicated by the physical fact of San Francisco. He published the Northern California Independent Booksellers Association's list of bestsellers and received their Friend of Independent Bookselling Award. A jury member for One City, One Book, San Francisco Reads, and the Commonwealth Club's California Book Awards, he also collaborated with the French Consulate in San Francisco for a uh, writing competition. Since he left the Chronicle, he has been missed. But over the past few months, he's shown that there's life after the Cron. <laughs> he's written for the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, and appeared on KQED Forum with Michael Krasny. John McMurtry is on a well-earned vacation abroad right now, but promise me that today he is lifting the glass to us here from afar. 
So let's give them a hand. Um, I'm probably not supposed to be biased as the MC, but John was such a wonderful colleague, and I'm so happy to see him get this award. Um, he did a lot for literature in the Bay Area. Um, but now I want to introduce to you the nominees in children's literature for younger readers. The first nominee is Tada by Kathy Ellen Davis, illustrated by Kalani Juanita. Tada starts like a typical once upon a time story but it quickly turns into a playful tale that challenges the notion of happily ever after. It begins with a young girl lost in imaginary play who is interrupted by a boy pretended, pretending to be a dragon. In the end, they find collaboration actually unlocks the greatest adventures. Juanita's illustrations bring the story to life with dramatic text layouts that reflect the children's wild imaginations. The next nominee is Ode to an Onion, Pablo Neruda and His Muse, by Alexandria Giardino, illustrated by Felici Felicity, Felicity, I'm going to be doing this all afternoon, by the way, <laughs> just to warn you. Felicita Sala, Ode to an Onion, celebrates the lives of 20th century Chilean poet Pablo Neruda and his wife, the musician Matil Matilda Uritia. Inspired by Pablo's poem, Oda a la Cibola, and Matilda's memoir, My Life with Pablo Neruda. This book teaches young readers that you can choose how to interpret the, ro the world simply by changing your perspective. The book even starts and ends with transparent paper that looks like onion skin. Third nominee, Part-Time Mermaid by Deborah Underwood, illustrated by Cambria Evans. In this lushly illustrated story of a little girl who, at night, transforms herself into the, a mermaid, the New York Times best-selling children's author, Deborah Underwood, offers us a world of undersea adventures. During the day, the girl must clean her room and remember not to splash when she is in the tub. But at the stroke of midnight, she grows a powerful, glimmering tail, slides down a magical water slide, and glides through the sea. Heroic, imaginative, the girl keeps a great ship from sinking and rescues a merboy who looks a lot like her little brother. <laughs> kind and loving, her parents have no idea they are living with a part-time mermaid. The Northern California Book Award for Children's Literature, Younger Readers is Ode to an Onion by Alexandria Giardino. Thank you so much. Um, what an honor. I saw the list of all the nominees, and I am, I'm beyond um, moved to be included with all of you, with all the writers, including um, the other nominees for this award. I love this moment in children's literature. It's um, as if we're having another renaissance. Thank you to the um, critics. It's really my honor that you considered my work and that you um, appreciate it, so thank you so much. I'm gonna read a bit from it, if you don't mind, um, but before I do that, uh, I wanted to let you know that Felicita Sala um, is the illustrator, and she lives in Rome. Um, I haven't gotten to meet her in person, but um, isn't she talented? She brought my words into um, just a whole other level, so I was really honored to collaborate with her and to um, create something with her that will endure for, for all of us. I also want to thank the publisher, Cameron, Cameron Kids, a local publisher, um, 
bravo for, for local publishing. Um, they are small but mighty, so keep an, keep an eye out for their books that are coming down the road because they, they do beautiful work and um, I was really privileged to work with them. So I'm gonna read just a little bit, maybe at one minute. Am I doing okay for time? Okay. Um, I was a translator of Pablo Neruda's wife's memoir and that's what inspired this book. Um, Matilde wrote this a whimsical description of a garden from her childhood, and so that's what inspired me to write this book for kids. I'll just um, read the first couple of pages, how about that? Um, Pablo was hard at work, writing a long, sad poem. His pen whirled, the pages piled high. The clock struck 12, Pablo jumped, he was going to be late for lunch with his friend Matilde. He combed his hair and wished he didn't look so gloomy. Matilde liked to laugh. She had a smile as wide as a guitar. Pablo tried to hide his glum expression behind a bouquet of poppies. No time for sadness, Matilde said as she filled a vase with water. Come, I need your help with lunch. And off they go into Matilde's garden where Pablo continues to see sad and gloomy things, and Matilde keeps reminding him to see beautiful things until finally he discovers the beauty of a humble onion. And she says, why don't you write something about an onion? And so he does, he writes an ode. And um, at the end, they have lunch. <laughs> and uh, Matilde was a lovely person. That was her personality. Um, I invented the story, but I was faithful to their to their real life and to their real emotional relationship and um, interactions. And at the back of the book, I translated the poem um, from Spanish into English. So thank you again so much. This is really quite an honor. I'm very moved and I appreciate your time. Thank you. We're going to move on to the nominees in children's literature for older readers. The first nominee is Picture Us in the Light by Kelly Loy Gilbert. It's about high school senior Danny Ching, who's blessed with close friends, loving parents, and a scholarship to the art school of his dreams. To pursue a career in art, however, he'll have to leave his best friend. Harry Wong, and that's a future that Danny can't quite imagine. Why should his attraction to Harry bother him so much when Harry is obviously involved with Regina Chan, a mutual friend of theirs? It's a romantic triangle. It's also about resonant universal themes that surface through the author's depiction of family dynamics and diversity in the Asian American community. The narrative interweaves the consequences of depression, suicide, and the need for human connection. Second nominee is Out of Left Field by Ellen Clagus. This is the story of 10-year-old Kathleen Curie Gordon, who is many things. She's a baseball player with a nasty knuckleball. She's a devoted San Francisco Seals fan. Wow, I haven't heard that in a while. She's a curious, creative thinker like the rest of her family, and she's not allowed to join her local Little League team. That's because it's 1957, and girls are barred from playing in Little League. Clagus has written a novel that, like its main character, is many things, a primer for research, a thoughtful introduction for young readers to civil rights, gender rights, desegregation, and the space race, and an exciting window into a little known part of history for baseball fans and otherwise. It's an invitation to examine who writes history and what gets left out. And our third nominee is Blanca and Roja, Roja by Anna Marie McLemore. Blanca and Roja de Cisney are polar opposites and rival outcasts. Yet their loyalty to each other is unwavering because they are bound by a curse that has plagued their family for generations. 
one of the girls will eventually transform into a swan. And you thought your family was complicated. <laughs> this is a contemporary and poignant Latinx mashup of the ugly duckling, the wild swans, and snow white, rose red. It is more than just the distillation of the fables it was inspired by. It's an entirely new class of fairy tale that examines the complexity of gender, the injustice of prejudice, and the triumph of overcoming disabilities. I imagine it's pretty hard to get through high school if you're gonna be turning into a swan. Okay. The Orphan Band of Springdale by Anne Nesbitt. In the tradition of To Kill a Mockingbird, this is a coming of age story set in small town America on the eve of World War II. The protagonist, Augusta, also known as Gusta, Hoopas Nubrenor is an 11-year-old girl sent off to her grandma Hoop's orphanage in Maine when her ger German-born father must run from the law and her mother can't earn enough in New York to care for her daughter. This novel asks some big questions that are relevant for today. How do we know what is true or right? How do you balance keeping peace with your neighbors with doing what you think is right? And the Northern California Book Awards for children's literature, older readers, is Blanca and Roja by Anna Marie McLemore. Wow, thank you so, so much. I can't tell you what this means to me and how grateful I am to be here. Um, I could tell you a lot of things about why I wrote this story, um, other than, of course, putting my queer Latina hands all over some of my favorite fairy tales. Um, but instead of trying to tell you the reasons I wrote this, I'm, I'm gonna let one of my characters tell you. This is Paige. Grandma Lynn had this way of reading me fairy tales, like she was telling me secrets I'd need one day. She leaned a little forward, meeting my eye, when the knight discovered the trick of lulling the dragon to sleep, or when the shepherd boy found the secret door. I lowered my head to hide my blush when I thought of the witches and princesses in those stories, of catching my fingers in hair as bright as red wheat or rich as threads of black silk. I thought of those magic-blooded girls taking me by my shirt collar to kiss me, the film of their skirts floating around us like curls of bright smoke. Grandma Lynn probably knew that. She knew in the same way she knew I would not grow out of wearing pants and collared shirts to church instead of my cousin's passed down dresses. She knew the same way she knew to call me young man, those words like fairy tale jewels. They were crowns I had found in a mist veiled palace, while the words young lady were a queen's apple or a spindle things that might turn out to poison me, but that I was expected to take. Fairy tales were a world I thought I knew, but the one I needed to know most was the one that took me the longest to understand. It wasn't until Blanca kissed me that I realized why the woods made me into a signet. It wasn't because Blanca and Roja's family came from swans. It was because a story chose me, even when I'd gotten it all wrong. I thought I knew the story of the ugly duckling, the signet who endures taunting and winter cold and being driven out of everywhere before discovering he is a swan. I thought it was all about the ugly duckling looking into the pond and discovering a magnificent bird. But it didn't happen that way. The way it happened was that the ugly duckling was so tired and cold and lonely that he'd been emptied out. He'd run from cats and children and mother ducks. He'd frozen in caves and ponds. So when he saw a flock of swans, wings shimmering like snow, he threw himself at them, deciding he would rather be destroyed by them than keep his distance. The ugly duckling's great surprise was not the moment he saw himself in the pond. That came later. The moment of his greatest shock was when the swans embraced him, took him into their flutter of wings. It was the moment they made themselves his family, it was when they recognized him before he recognized himself. I had always made a sorry imitation of a girl, 
awkward and miserable in dresses and shined white shoes, but with the shift of changing into jeans and a plain shirt, with letting go of trying to make myself fit the words girl and young lady, I came to understand that I was not a girl who was terrible at being a girl. I was a boy who hadn't realized it yet. The story of the ugly duckling was never about the signet discovering he is lovely. It is not a story about realizing you have become beautiful. It is about the sudden understanding that you are something other than what you thought you were and that what you are is more beautiful than what you once thought you had to be. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to keep pulling on this. Um, Anna Marie, thank you, that was really beautiful. Um, and I'm super happy that the nominees are, are reading a bit from their work too. It gives us like a three for one event happening here. Um, next up we have the nominees for um, Poetry in Translation. Um, and I'm so happy we have this category because there's so much actually happening in this genre. Um, and we have two wonderful nominees today. The first is Wild Geese Sorrow, the Chinese wall inscriptions at Angel Island, translated by Jeffrey Thomas Leong. These anonymous poems carved in a wooden wall by non-literary writers educated in the classical Chinese tradition are compelling testimony of an earlier episode in US history and frankly, San Francisco history um, that dates back to when Chinese immigrants in search of a better life were inhumanly domain, detained on Angel Island. Um, the poems date from 1910 to 1940 and Jeff Leong this is his first translated collection, and he's bringing us an important historical document of rescued literature and rescued history. The second nominee is Poetry Comes Out of My Mouth, selected poems of Mario Santiago Papasquiaro. It's translated from Spanish by Arturo Man Mantican and the artwork is by Maceo Montaya. In the 1970s, when literature in Mexico City was highly controlled by the dominating political party, infrarealism, sometimes called visceral realism, raised its voice in a poetics of unassim unassimilable opposition. Papas Chiaro cracks open his consciousness like some demonically possessed pinata and outpours a storm of uncontrollable incantation, deftly caught in Monte Khan's deeply informed translation. The Northern California Book Award for translation and poetry goes to Wild Geese Sorrow, the, child, the Chinese Wall Inscriptions at Angel Island, translated by Jeffrey Thomas Leon. Thank you very much. Um, I also am deeply honored to uh, acknowledge this award on behalf of Wild Geese Sorrow, and I'd like to also congratulate the other nominee in this category. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important that this award uh, helps to make um, uh, the work of these Chinese American immigrants over 100 years ago available to the public, and especially in this time of immigration hysteria and scapegoating. Uh, this morning's ice raids were delayed, but the threats are still there. So I think the work of uh, 100 years ago does speak to us in the present. Uh, I'm going to just read to you a brief selection uh, of poems from the book. And the book is written, I just want to say one thing, the book is written uh, on the walls of the Angel Island Immigration Station, which is here in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, you can go out there, it's a public place. And they were written for each other. The detainees were speaking to each other. 
So imagine you're listening in on their conversation. Poem 20, Deep Night. In the still of night, small sounds are a howling wind. Shadows, an ache of old wounds, so I recite verse. Fog and mist drift, a gloomy sky. Insects rub crick-crack beneath the moon's faint light. My sad and bitter face matches these heavens. A worried man sits alone, leans at the window's sill. Toisan, formerly known as Yi. This next poem is written by a detainee who just found out that he is to be deported. Poem 49. My petition denied already half a year with no further news. Who knew that today I would be deported back to Tong Mountain? At midship, I'll suffer waves and pearl-like tears will fall. On a clear night, three times I'll find the bitterness hard to bear. Another kind of feeling and emotion that was expressed was one of frustration and anger. Poem 60. I clasped hands in parting with my brothers and classmates. Because of the mouth waded swiftly across the Pacific. Who knew that the Western barbarians bereft of compassion or reason? 100 cases of petty abuse against the tongue. Countless interrogations and still not done. What's more, must stand naked just to check the lungs. Compatriots, we've come to this. All because our nation's power, too weak to protect, come that day when China unites, I myself will rip out the barbarian's heart and guts. And this last poem uh, is, uh, exemplifies one of the purposes of the poetry, which was to console each other and give each other encouragement. Poem 70. Shu of Hyeongsan exhorts the sojourner. When talking of going to the land of the flower flag, my face beamed with happiness. I dug up a thousand gold pieces, but leaving more difficult. Saying goodbye to my parents, I choked with sadness. When parting from my wife, many feelings and shared tears. Frequently, waves big as mountains terrified us travelers. Petty bureaucracy, like a tiger, doubles the barbarian's bite. Never forget this day when you go ashore. Push hard on your journey. Don't be lazy or idle. Thank you very much. I just want to remind you that um, all of these incredible books we're talking about are available out in the lobby. So please support these incredible authors and the huge amount of work that they have put into these projects. We are now moving to the uh, award for translation in prose. And the nominees for this are Poso Wells by Gabriela Aleman, translated from Spanish by Dick Cluster. Poso Wells is a fictional small town in contemporary Ecuador. It's plagued by political and economic corruption, poverty, and disturbing happenings, including the repeated disappearances of townspeople and visitors. Dick Cluster's translation captures this small, impoverished rural town that rests uneasily upon tunnels of terror. I Didn't Talk by Beatrice Brasher, translated from the Portuguese by Adam Morris. This novel, set in the present era in Brazil, follows the life of Gustavo, a teacher who's about to retire. It's set in the 1970s, which was a time of unrest and dictatorship in Brazil. 
And Adam Morris's translation powerfully de depicts Gustavo, his family, their relationship, and their world. Revolution Sunday by Wendy Guerrera, translated by the Spanish by Aki Oba Oba Obajas. And if I mispronounce that, I really apologize. On the first page, the reader slips into the world of Guerrera's tale, a woman poet's life in contemporary Cuba, where the books she writes are not available because they do not support the view of Cuban life that the government demands. The English language choices crafted by the translator reflect very well the language of the author, who was first and foremost a poet. And the Northern California Book Award for translation and prose goes to I Didn't Talk by Beatrice Brahir, translated by, from the Portuguese by Adam Morris. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to accept this award uh, for myself, but also on behalf of the author. Uh, she'll be thrilled uh, when I tell her about it. Now, as a description from the pamphlet might suggest, this was not an uplifting text. Uh, it's narrated by a torture survivor. But uh, nothing happening, nothing very much happening right now in Brazil is very uplifting either. And I know that the author has been very distressed uh, by what's happening there. And I think the most important thing I can say right now is that she would implore all of you to inform yourselves uh, about what's happening in Brazil, the political situation there. So uh, without further ado, I'll just read a selection from the text. And this is Gustavo speaking in 2004, recalling the 1970s. I found out later that the organization had rules about what to say and when to say it once someone is captured. If people fell, they needed to resist a few days in silence, after which it wouldn't be so serious if they gave up addresses and names, because the information would already be useless. There were other things that could be divulged during torture sessions. Given that talking was necessary to avoid being killed, tell them whatever they want to hear. Buy time for the machine to be disassembled and for your comrades to go into hiding. They started by saying what was already in the open, merely confirming what the soldiers already knew, making subsequent depositions seem credible, feeding their torturers a few valid facts as though they were already giving in. And then, between the useless facts, the names and addresses of idiots like me, people who knew nothing and would certainly be released when it turned out they had a solid alibi. But I didn't know any of this, and beneath the blows, I tried to keep guessing at the language, the codes, and procedures. Armando was a good militant, and in spite of our close friendship, in truth, because of it, he never told me anything about his activities. The torturers already knew much more than me. Armando had participated in a kidnapping and a bank robbery. He'd laundered money, prepared safe houses for fugitives. The part about safe houses I knew. Later I found out the rest was just as true. In our apartment, we took in a low life from Hyoganji du Sul, whose nom de guerre was Joyce. He tried to seduce Eliana and all her friends. After I became a deaf widower, I learned that I could have said anything I knew. Armando would not have been affected by my words. Thank you. Um, 
Um, Adam, thank you so much. And thank you for the reading. My not so secret plan to have everyone read is working. Um, and now we're going to move to the nominees in general nonfiction. The first nominee is American Prison, a reporter's undercover journey into the business of punishment by Shane Bauer. American Prison details the months that Bauer spent working undercover in a prison in Wynn Correctional Center in Louisiana. That's a privately owned prison um, and it's owned by the Corrections Corporation of America. Relying on evidence gathered by cameras and tape recorders that he smuggled into the prison during his daily shift, Bauer carefully builds a portrait of a system that destroys both the captured and the captors. We follow him through the realities of a job that he soon learns is both dangerous and demeaning. His portraits of fellow workers are carefully and humanely drawn, and his depictions of prisoners bring us into this dangerous world. And then they were gone. Teenagers of People's Temple, from high school to Jonestown, by, D by Judy Bebelar and Ron Cabral. Although well over 50 books and articles have been published documenting the Jonestown tragedy of 1978, none have explored the heartbreaking and powerful story of the teenagers who lived and died there. Judy Bebelar and Ron Cabral tell that story objectively, compellingly, and finally. Both for those of us who remember and those of us who have never known, this book is testimony keeping these young people alive in our minds. Crush, The Triumph of California Wine by John Briscoe. This is the story of the triumph of California wine, but it is also the story of California itself, told through the history of the wine industry. Readers are taken inside the history of California's wine pioneers the early barons of the industry, and then to the families and names familiar to contemporary wine buyers and, drink and drinkers. John Briscoe's prose is compelling, keeping readers enthralled with fascinating stories of catastrophe after catastrophe before finally reaching the pinnacle of success, a California wine demonstrating its triumph in the famous Paris wine tasting of 1976. Birds of Berkeley by Oliver James. This is a song of praise to the Denzians of the author's city of Berkeley, seemingly threatened by unstoppable climate change. James introduces us to 25 fellow citizens, also known as birds, who occupy our daily spaces. He begins with a bird vocabulary and suggestions for identifying particular birds, ending with a brief bibliography. It would indeed be economical to love our fellow creatures who inhabit the earth with us, as James suggests we do. That love might save us all. Almost Nothing, the 20th Century Art and Life of Joseph Sabaski by Eric Carpelles. This search for and resurrection of the Polish writer, artist, and intellectual Joseph Zbaski begins with Marcel Proust, whose search for lost time resulted in uncovering an entire cultural era. Zbaski had a privileged youth, but it spanned from lectures he gave while a prisoner in a World War II Soviet prison camp to becoming the editor in Paris of Kultura, a journal for Polish intellectuals whose work was banned under the communists. Almost nothing is meticulously researched and compellingly written about a figure of the era who we should all know more about. Although his art never received much critical attention and his writings remain largely untranslated, 
Carpellis shows us what an individual life led with integrity and purpose can teach us all. And the Northern California Book Award in general nonfiction goes to American Prison, a reporter's undercover journey into the business of punishment. Shane Bauer is uh, reporting in the Middle East right now. So he sent over a statement, which I am going to read. Unfortunately, it means we will not have a reading from the book, so that's the only problem. But I am honored to have American Prisoner recognized alongside such amazing books and authors. I wrote American Prison to shed light on the private prison industry and the long history of for-profit incarceration in this country. I hope this award encourages writers and journalists out there to continue to investigate the powerful. Thank you so much to the reviewers and to the Northern California Book Awards for supporting local writers. And now we're going to do creative nonfiction. Lyric multiples, aspiration, practice, eminence, migration by George Albon. It is a great gift to society when an intelligent, insightful reader of poetry finds a way to light up the craft for a general audience. George Albon's first four essay collection is that gift. Poetry occasions each of the essays, but it's ultimately a springboard to a wide-ranging uh, discussion of structures, pop music, and the punk movement, among other things. In Albin's hands, the more far-flung and eccentric the analogy or parallel, the more perfectly it ends up coming together. I'm sorry, I think I said this was his first collection, which is not actually the case. The Monk of Mocha by Dave Eggers. Do you want to hear my story? That's how Mokhtar Alkanshali, a Yemeni American and a, budding, and a budding coffee impresario, addresses his captor. Alkanshali is improvising this, Shahariz this Shaharazadian technique after being kidnapped by a militia in Yemen, where he was traveling in the hopes of developing trade with local coffee farmers. Instead, he and other American citizens find themselves stranded when a Saudi-led coalition begins dropping US-made bombs on Yemeni targets in 2014, bombs which often hit civilians. Eggers proves to be quite a Shahazarad himself as he unfolds a narrative that manages to be both suspenseful and informative. Flunk, start, reclaiming my decade lost in Scientology by Sands Hall. Sands Hall found herself drawn to the Church of Scientology after an incident in which her brother suffered brain damage in a fall. An intriguing investigation of the secretive cult of Scientology during the 1980s, which was the era when its founder, L. Ron Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard died. This book is unique in its luminous and keen exploration of how a cult gains an unlikely member and what it takes to find one's way out again. This is a generous and penetrating book, a profound act of psychological inquiry. A Last Survivor of the Orphan Trains by William Walters and Victoria Golden. In 1930, a four-year-old boy stood on a train platform in Gallup, New Mexico. A middle-aged couple, Henry and Eleanor Walters, stepped forward and claimed him and claimed him. So began the lifelong odyssey of William Walters, who was born into a loving but poor family in Pennsylvania. After his mother's death, William was put on one of the last orphan trains. 
which began in 1854 and were meant to place indigent children in families in the then populated western states. In clear and lucid prose, Victoria Golden worked intensively with Walters to capture his story, some of which he had never been able to express. Raw Material, Working Wool in the West by Stephanie Wilkes. Stephanie Wilkes might just emerge as the Alice Waters of the sustainable clothing move movement. In this debut, she shows a remarkable ability to write from both head and heart as she narrates her position from an alienated tech worker to certified sheep shearer and promoter of natural fibers. Lovingly and thoroughly written, raw material is a cutting age paean to the next movement in sustainability and to a way of life made newly relevant by the looming threat of climate change. The Northern California Book Award in Creative Nonfiction goes to The Monk of Mocha by Dave Eggers. And since Dave is unable to accept the award, we are extremely fortunate today to have Mokhtar Alkanshali accepting for him. Universal greetings of peace, love, and justice. Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is all very surreal for me. I grew up not that far from here in the Tenderloin, a neighborhood that comedian Dave Chappelle once described as and said, ain't nothing tender about that place. <laughs> but it actually is. Uh, for me as a young kid growing up in that environment, it was very difficult to escape the harsh realities of life. Uh, growing up in a one bedroom with nine people, my dad a mini bus driver, but I found my escape through books. And if you think about it, books are pretty incredible things, right? The idea that you can open up a few pages and escape to a different reality. Um, many of my books I borrowed from the library here, sometimes indefinitely. <laughs> we actually launched our, our, uh, this book in front of the city, steps of City Hall uh, last year. And then Luis Herrera, the former San Francisco librarian, was there. And I asked him to, you know, forgive me for that. And he um, forgave me for my, <laughs> those book finds. And I left home with a library card. Um, but uh, Dave really wanted to be here. He just couldn't make it. He was, he is in DC at the American Library Association Conference. I can't really read a lot of the book because it's it's awkward to read about yourself in the third person. Um, so please uh, give a round of applause for my dear friend Fatima, she's somewhere here, who will read some excer excerpts from this book. And again, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful award. What an honor. Here it goes. Hopefully I do some justice to these beautiful words. Muhtad is both humble before the history he inhibits and irreverent about his place in it. But his story is an old fashioned one. It's chiefly about the American dream, which is very much alive and very much under threat. His story is also about coffee and about how he tried to improve coffee production in Yemen where coffee cultivation was first undertaken 500 years ago. It's also about the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco, a valley of desperation in a city of towering wealth, about the families that live here and struggle to live there safely with dignity. It's about the strange preponderance of Yemenis in the liquor store trade of California and the unexpected history of Yemenis in the Central Valley, and how their work in California echoes their long history of farming in Yemen, and how direct tr trade can change the lives of farmers, 
given them agency and standing, and how Americans like Muhtar al like how Americans like Muhtar al Khinshadi, a U.S. citizens who maintain strong ties to the countries of their his their history, the ancestors, and who through entrepreneurial zeal and dogged labor create indispensable bridges between the developed and developing worlds, between nations that produce and those that consume, and those bridge makers exquisitely and bravely embody this nation's reason for being a place of radical opportunity and ceaseless welcome. And how when we forget that this is central to all, that is best about this country, and we forget ourselves. A blended people united not by status and cowardice and fear, but by irrational exuberance, by global enterprise on a human scale, and by inherent righteous, righteousness of pressing forward, always forward, driven by the courage unfettered and unyielding. I am so proud of you, Muqtad. Um, thank you both so much for that. And um, Mukhtar, I, I want you to know that perhaps your conversation with the head librarian here had a big impact because I know that the San Francisco Public Library is waiving its fees now for people. So all the better to encourage children like you once were to, to keep reading. So thank you for that. Um, Next up is going to be the um, Northern California Book Awards, uh, Book Reviews Groundbreaker Award. And here to present it is NCBR member Francis Phillips. This is going to be a brief moment of, of um, microphone adjustment because I might be one of the shortest speakers and my uh, recipient is one of the tallest. But uh, So 50 years ago, the National Endowment for the Arts had what I think was a really good idea, which was to invest in the vitality of literature by funding uh, nonprofit print centers in a number of places across the country and nonprofit book distribution centers for small presses. And Berkeley, California was lucky to land both of those, the West Coast Print Center and Small Press Distribution. Among the print centers, uh, the one in New York closed not so long ago after a long, long history. The West Coast Print Center's holdings are at Mills now. And the distribution centers, the one standing is small press distribution. Um, in, on the SPD website, it says, can you believe that SPDs made it 50 years without the warehouse collapsing and the books crumbling irreversibly into dust? Let us have a moment. In, contemporary literary, in a contemporary literary environment populated by big corporations and quick delivery online shopping, we at SPD are really proud of how far we've come in our ability to get small press books from publishers into the hands of those who'd like to read them, all the while staying fiercely independent and powered by a minimal staff. So this is a 50th anniversary for SPD. I'm going to give you six things I love about it. The sixth one is the one to grow on. Uh, one, the others are for each decade. So first, as suggested in what SPD said, at a time when so much retail and book selling is collapsing and reorganizing, SPD's book sales have increased in each of the last few years. It gets me to the books I can't get anywhere else. It engages readers with small press books beyond the buying and selling. For instance, SPD was doing a poetry swap with teenagers a while back where a teen could write a poem and exchange it for a book for free. And they lead reading groups at some local public libraries. I love that it wraps books in brown paper. Every shipment arrives like a tidy little gift, sometimes with a personal note and without a whole lot of bubble wrap. 
It injects independent literature into my workday. I have a little prick of joy in my mind when I see the email titled SPD Handpicked Books or Best of All, New Poetry Bestsellers. And finally, my sixth one to grow on is it's been a place for writers who've lived and worked together. I would honor, I'm going to make the mistake of forgetting many people, but I think of Jean Day, Laura Moriarty, Steve Dickinson, and Brent Cunningham, who's here now, who have inhaled literature by day and gone home to write it on the weekends and at night. So Brent, thank you for carrying on this tradition, and I'm honored to present this to you. Well, thank you so very much. Um, appreciate it very deeply and uh, way too many people to thank. Of course, I'm only receiving this on behalf of a lot of people's labor over a lot of decades. 50 years is a lot of time. I have been at SPD for 20 years myself. And uh, I often, not, not really jokingly, maybe half jokingly say that SPD um, is a critical component of uh, poetry infrastructure and poetry and fiction, uh, but it's kind of known as a uh, distributor of poetry. And uh, believe it or not, poetry infrastructure is not that sexy of a, of a term. <laughs> uh, and it can be hard to sell uh, to, to granting organizations. It can be hard, you know, the beautiful work that you're seeing, the content of these writers um, is a little bit more um, public sometimes than the background work that myself and, and staff of now up to, uh, I think, 14 uh, are doing every day, packing these books, shipping them out, going to trade shows and so forth. We are, um, you know, quick numbers for you. There's uh, a little under 400 small publishers that we are the umbrella for and we distribute for. Um, <clears throat> together, they publish about 1,000 books a year. These are people with day jobs that are publishing, you know, in their spare time. Um, and they, without SPD, they, it would be, I'm sure that the, there would, these books would be maybe on Amazon and, and they'd have a website and they'd sell them. But SPD is the crucial link between these small presses and the book trade, right? A, a store, a library, a college bookstore, the jobbers, the kind of background of the book industry would never touch these books without SPD as the middle person. So that's really the, the core thing, that the reason for existence, um, and, and the thing that we, we go to work for um, every day. And I'd say a few of the books will sell more than 1,000 copies. There's a few you know, bestsellers that certainly crest at a kind of respectable number for the book trade. But again, these are books selling uh, not that many copies. So no for-profit distributor would touch them. Uh, for the most part, and they would, uh, these writers would really have a little bit less sales. Um, and why is that important? You know, why does that matter? <clears throat> and I think that the people here, there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of book reviewers, and, um, you know, as a writer, I just want to remind ourselves why that matters, which is that uh, when I was very young, I thought, you know, wanted to be a writer, that what mattered would be winning the National Book Award and Nobel Prize and so forth, right? But I've had a few books out. And, and the difference between having zero reviews and one, uh, the difference between selling 250 and 110, these things can start to seem really meaningless from the perspective of you know, the general uh, literary culture. But as a writer, it's everything, right? It's absolutely everything. It can make the difference between just believing you can continue on. And so that's really the role for SPD, and I think it's the role for a lot of reviewers out there, people who are laboring at literature. Every little bit, every little thing that, that so many of you in this room are doing uh, matters crucially um, to, to just keeping the, the ecosystem going. And uh, you know, it doesn't take away from the glory of the, these wonderful prizes and the books that are great, but there's this vast underpinning, and it's just so nice to see it recognized uh, in the form of SPD, and we're gonna make a lot of hay with this award, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> Ooh, okay.
Okay. <laughs> Much taller than I am. Um, thank you, Brent. Next up, we have fiction, which is a very exciting category. I have to say, I mean, it, it's kind of my job to be like really excited by all of these books, but these are really, really good books that are <laughs> nominated this year. Um, and again, they're all going to be outside for you to buy. The Incendiaries by R.O. Kwan. This haunting debut novel glows from within. Will Kendall narrates the story of obsession, his for Phoebe Len, a glamorous student he meets at Edwards, an elite American university. Phoebe's obsession for finding God in the form of John Leal, a charismatic leader of a secretive religious cult. The Incendiaries is told in three voices. Kwan's tale of extremist violence propels the backstories of Will, Phoebe, and John. Rendered in lyrical prose, the sentences pulse on the page. Like Rumpelstiltskin, Kwan has woven pure gold. The Winter Soldier, Daniel Mason. This historical fiction novel and profoundly gripping love story focuses on a, po a Polish-Austrian doctor from Vienna, beginning with his days as a medical student in the twilight of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and ending in post-World War I, Europe. Mason's details are so masterfully woven into the action of the text that the reader feels a part of the story rather than an outsider observing it. The beautiful finale is crafted in such a way that the reader is forced to evaluate the balance of a love affair that is impossible and the freedom that comes with ultimately letting go of an obsession. There, There by Tommy Orange. This strong debut novel, furious and tender, brutal and soulful, electrifying and mundane, offers, offers us entry into the often invisible world of Native Americans living in today's West, and specifically today's Oakland. The novel sketches in concise but telling detail a dozen characters on their way for very different reasons to the big Oakland powwow. The event will draw them together the way a kaleidoscope unites its bright fragments into a design as satisfying as it is surprising. Winter Kept Us Warm, Anne Rath. This debut novel by the author of The Jungle Around Us, which won the 2015 Flannery O'Connor Award, follows the members of a menage a trois from young adulthood to old age. The novel's structure manages to span not only time, but also space. From Berlin to Manhattan, from Los Angeles to Morocco, thanks to the centripetal force provided by its three compelling characters. How the trio travels to, to this point from their origin in Berlin is what we read to discover. Hungry Ghost Theater, Sarah Stone. A novel is splendid, splendidly strange as its title. This is an ambitious, formally audacious, and highly theatrical saga of three generations of a Northern California family who run the San Francisco-based avant-garde News of the World Theater Collective. They specialize in dramatizing dark, politically charged events, such as the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. The novel is set primarily in the Bay Area, but we also see its characters through New York City, Seoul, and Zanzibar. There is even a long, startling section that takes place in hell. That's where two of the members of the family, Eva and Julia, are joined by a she-wolf, Cinetars, the Lord of Death, the Queen of the Underworld, and a troop of dancing hungry ghosts. Okay. The Northern California Book Award in fiction goes to The Winter Soldier by Daniel Mason.
thank you, thank you much, thank you so much, everybody, for for this. It's a, re a real honor for me. Um, I grew up in California, live in California. I've been working on this book for 14 years and began it when I was living in San Francisco. So this library is a special place in my heart. Um, all that said, um, it would be a little bit of a stretch to say that the book is set here, uh, given that it's, it's set in World War I on the Eastern Front. Um, nevertheless, um, even though I never had a chance to go, or maybe because I never had a chance to go um, out to, to Eastern Europe where the book takes place, um, there's a lot of California in it in, in quiet ways. And I just got back from the Sierras on Thursday, and I was reminded how much the mountains in my book are actually um, the Sierra Nevada dressed in Central European flora. <laughs> so I thought I would read a scene in which, um, which has some of Northern California uh, smuggled into a, a Central European spring. So this is um, at a field hospital in an area which is now sort of the border region of Southern Poland and, and Ukraine. Um, and it's after an intense period of winter fighting uh, and, and spring has, has has come, um, though with it, um, and lack of lack of food and, and hunger. So, um, the 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 men in the hospital need to find something to eat. They turned to the woods. Those able to walk set off together. It was Margareta who taught them how to gather. So this is the nurse in the hospital, the one nurse in the hospital, who taught them how to gather. Showed the city men from Budapest and Krakow and Vienna how to identify goosefoot and clubrush to select saddle fungus and pig's ear mushrooms from the tree trunks, horsetail cones from the river, sweet calamus shoots and tender bracken stems to roast. On the green open slopes, they picked pot herbs, sorrel and saltbrush, dandelion, lungwort, goosefoot, swine thistle. They found fresh pine needles to stretch their bread, made gruel from the green seeds of manna grass, they fermented hogweed in ammunition tins and boiled the budding leaves of the lindens. She showed them how to strip bark from the lindens, the birches, the maples, the hazels, to dry and roast and bake into their breads, to make soups of birch buds, butter out of birch sap, bread from the roots of quack grass, sweet snacks from mallow seed and roots of cocksfoot and polypody. She warned them against the roots of calamus that would make them see ghosts. When they split into pairs after a week, she said, the doctor will come with me. Lucius was self-conscious by his selection, sensed the men exchanging glances, and he told himself that it was only natural. She remained cautious of soldiers, as she should. She wore a single soldier's greatcoat, hemmed so as not to drag in the mud. Over her shoulder, she hung a burlap sack from the muzzle of her rifle, as if it were a milkmaid's yoke. It was clear now that his early speculations as to her origins in the mountains were correct. He struggled to keep up. She was swift, moving over stones and fallen logs without breaking stride. She plunged her hands gloveless into dirt or snow, tore bark from the trees, brushed off a tuber before testing it with a bite. He was struck by how she never hesitated, but this was a familiar movement from her approach to wounds. They spoke little while they walked. Around them, the whole world seemed to be turning to water. The earth was sodden, the trail shimmering with runoff. Ferns the color of mantises unfurled from the black rock and rotting mosses. Steam rose from the wet bark, and from the upper slopes, the remaining snowfields calved in little avalanches, thundering through the trees. At times, they passed women from the village, similarly following the narrow paths in search of food. He felt uneasy then, as if it were their woods in which he was foraging. But the women seemed less suspicious there, in the forest, smiling with a kind of fellow spirit as they passed each other on the trail. I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. very helpful to know what we need to do in case there's a war here, right? Look for tubers. Next we have the nominees in poetry. Senzontle, 
by Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. This highly acclaimed debut collection explores the depth of the failure of languages in growing up undocumented. Everybody okay over there? Okay, we'll continue. The failure of languages in growing up undocumented, not only in not being understood, but also in not understanding oneself. It explores equally the coming into speech, the hollowness of pre-made language, what it means to play expected and unexpected roles, and always having to calibrate how much to reveal or not. Castillo weaves a surreal spell to say the unsayable, how to come out to his wife, how to speak from the hollowness of language by inhabiting it, how to mock it. Be With by Forrest Gander. Be With is Forrest Gander's latest collection of poetry. It's a series of brilliant flashes into the hidden world of the emotions. Although occasioned by the death of his mother and his wife, the death of his mother and the death of his wife, not the death of one person. The book is less a traditional elegy than an extended meditation on grief. Gander's struggle with the ineffable offer readers cues as they contemplate their own emotional reality. Her Mouth as Souvenir by Heather June Gibbons. This first full-length collection speaks with astonishing clarity. The voice is edgy, double-edged in fact, and constantly honed. My project is plain persistence, Gibbons tells us. Self as spatula, scraping self as burned crud off skillet. As child, as lover, as citizen of the world, her discontent follows her. Gibbons was raised in the Mormon church. She grew up in Utah and fled. She relishes her role as outsider and outcast, although she can't escape her people completely. In the book's valedictory poem, we find her scrolling backward through a friend's Facebook page. Knife girl, Amy. Amy committed suicide. Here it is, the very last thing she wrote. 3 a.m., she can't sleep. She posts a photo of a woman's mouth, a bullet in her teeth. Extra Hidden Life, Among the Days by Brenda Hillman. Brenda Hillman's latest collection continues her brilliant echo-poetic exploration of the natural world, where the invisible is thick, where all things, from the smallest motes of leaf dust, the atoms in a single cell, to a grieving human heart, coexist in our endangered, self-absorbed, selfie-ridden world, like activists living together in a commune. Think of the book as a peaceful protest march, a gathering of words meant to bring about critical change. Awake, aware, yet hopeful, the intellectual, spiritual, and poetic breadth of these poems is astounding. Isako Isako by Mia Ayumi Malhotra. In 1940, during World War II, the state of California and other Western states interned from 110,000 to 120,000 of people of Japanese ancestry. Isako Isako is Mia Ayumi Malhotra's magnitude, Earth, magnitude seven earthquake of a book. Through three distinct sections, Malhotra immortalizes the sad and lonely arc of innocent victims, the permanent scars of nuclear war, and the low-grade fever of misery that results from wandering and living as other. Flyover Country by Austin Smith. Smith is a native Midwesterner who explores how we grapple with nature. That includes the chaos and wildness that we as a species embody as we try to tame what's wild so that we can profit from it. 
A compelling dynamic in the book is the concept of flyover country. How our communal ambitions look from the sky. But Smith is too smart to explore humanity through just one lens. He broadens our viewpoint by grounding other poems in specific family stories and direct interactions with the quotidian. The Northern California Book Award for Poetry goes to Extra Hidden Life Among the Days by Brenda Hillman. And since Brenda Hillman is actually teaching poetry this weekend for the community of writers in Squaw Valley, NCBR member Lee Rossi is going to accept the award on her behalf. Sorry about jumping the gun like that. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to accept this award for Brenda. Imagine, you know, she's off teaching poetry somewhere. Um, I have a message from her, a brief message, and then I'll read a couple of poems. First, I better put on my glasses. I am at a conference in the mountains, otherwise I would be here with you today. I am deeply honored to be in the company of the wonderful poets named as finalists, and truly honored that my book was selected from among them. I began this book when I was thinking about the environmental destruction of our forests and about the ongoing political and social traumas in this country. Along the way, the writing also became a vehicle for expressing the personal losses of my father and of my friend, C.D. Wright, and for thinking about the great love and celebration of individual lives on Earth. Despite the difficulties of being human, we have our language and our love, and the non-material, natural, non-human natural world still provides magnificent and astonishing beauty. I want to thank Bob Haas specifically for his love and support, thank my friends and family for being patient with a poet's erratic nature, and thanks to our amazing California literary community, and that includes all of you. So I'll read two poems from the book. The first is called, Species Prepare to Exist After Money. Turns out bacteria communicate in color. They warn each other in teal or celadon, and humans assign meaning to this, saying they are distressed, are full of longing. The wood rack makes a, makes a nest of H's. It hoards the seven tiny silences. Crows in the pine can count specific faces, like writers who feel their art has been ignored. Who do we know like that? My father spent his life thinking about money, though he knew it causes most of this stupid violence. And he thought of me as a sensible person. You have the chemical for sensible, he said. There was no tragedy between us, unlike how poor Joyce wrote that his daughter turned away from that battered cabman's face, the world. I didn't turn away because I don't know where it is. It is all over, and when it seems pure nothingness has come to pass, I know another animal prepares itself, nationless, not sensible. Thinking of it helps a little bit. And then the second poem is the first part of a um, uh, an elegy, well, you could call it an elegy, or an ode, rather, in praise of the national seashore. And, ho and humans walked to the edge of the sand through a bank of verbena and fog. They thought they'd never get over the deaths, but they were starting to. Worry about money rested in their phones. Talk of candidates had stalled. Some sang. Grays of objects rested in their packs. They had come to the edge with children or with friends. Big nothing quieted the crows, wings of dried ink. The snake had gone back to the hills, to velvet and the brian grasses. 
It digested a mouth, a, a mouse near its spine. Some sang. The fox went back and would never meet the stake except for, except through the ampersand. The memory of failure failed for an hour. Some sang. The future was a cosmic particle seen once a long time ago. Those who had tried too often walked with those who had yet to try, as doubt can walk beside a radical hope. Thank you. Now we have the Fred Cody Award for Lifetime Achievement, presented by the Northern California Book Reviewers. And here to present that award is Joyce Jenkins. Hello, my friends. I, Sandra, are you in the house? There she is, Sandra. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Please, um, please start making your way up here to address us on the side here. She, it's a ramp. I'm sorry, we were trying to find you to help you and we just couldn't find you, I'm so sorry. But it's up the ramp, so while I'm talking, if you could just make it up, unless you want to try the steps, but the, okay, okay, you got it. We're so glad you're here. And we are gratified, truly gratified, to present the Fred Cody Award for Lifetime Achievement in Literary Service to poet and critic Sandra M. Gilbert. With the publication of The Mad Woman in the Attic, The Woman Writer and the 19th Century Literary Imagination, Sandra M. Gilbert and her co-author and collaborator, Susan Gubar, basically put feminist criticism on the literary map. Joyce Carol Oates said, The Mad Woman in the Attic, originally published in 1979, has long since become a classic one of the most important works of literary criticism of the 20th century. That book and the writings that followed had such a broad cultural impact that in 1986, Gilbert and Gubar were jointly named Ms. Magazine's Woman of the Year for their work as head editors of the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women. Today, we're honored to celebrate her rich and eventful career as critic editor, teacher, mentor, and prolific poet who has just published her 10th collection, Judgment Day. She is Professor Emerita at the University of California, Davis. Her awards and honors are distinguished, fascinating, and almost too numerous to list. And she is not resting on her laurels. Her recent project, editing the deeply important essential essays Culture, Politics, and the Art of Poetry by the late poet Adrian Rich. Sandra Gilbert has created a new vista of Rich's courageous political prose. This Fred Cody Award is especially poignant because Adrian Rich also received this very award. In 1984, the great Carolyn Kaiser said, Ms. Gilbert's wit, energy, and intelligence are formidable. She is well on her way to becoming one of our preeminent women of letters. Well, my friends, she is now absolutely a preeminent woman of letters. And we are lucky to have her in our midst, in our Northern California literary community. I want in here to give this time to Sandra, because as she taught us, women should speak for themselves. Please. Welcome, Sandra M. Gilbert. Do you need a chair? Oh, 
no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Here's, the, here's your certificate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. I apologize to the man over there in front of me. We, we disturbed him because we kept wondering how I was going to get up on the stage. But we ended up doing it the hard way. I, I, there was another way around, but I couldn't figure it out. Not great at topography. Not my, not my forte. I am just so thrilled and honored and grateful to be here. Joyce, thank you so much for every word you said. And thanks so much to the Bay Area Book Reviewers. Um, this is a, quite an overwhelming moment. Um, I came to California with my husband and children more than half a century ago. And by 1969, exactly 50 years ago, we were settled in the North Berkeley house where I still live and where most of us assemble for holidays. I was a poet, a teacher, a critic, and naturally, I needed a bookstore. Where to go? Why, to Cody's books, of course, where I spent many happy hours perusing shelves laden with volumes I could find nowhere else. At Cody's, I could get my poetry fix, my lit crit fix, my philosophy fix, my fiction fix, my anthropology fix, and so much more. And needless to say, there were always great readings at Cody's, and I was thrilled when I myself was asked to read there on several occasions. But not as thrilled as I am now to accept the Fred Cody Award and to thank Joyce Jenkins and everyone else who was responsible for this in the Bay Area Book Reviewers Association, whoever else had a hand in bestowing this amazing honor on me. As I stand here brimming with gratitude, I imagine that magical corner location, Telegraph and Haste, once again populated by all the poets and writers and students and readers, and best of all, books, 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 in their infinite variety, just waiting for us to plunge into their delicious pages. In the 60s and the 70s, as so many of us became activists, we were nurtured in our dreams of cultural transformation by the bold model of Cody's, its support its support of the free speech movement, its outstanding contributions to a community that yearned for better, more democratic, and more peaceful times. As my own contribution to the ongoing struggle of which Cody's books was always a part, I want to end here by reading an early, really early poem of mine, one that I often read at Cody's, about immigration, which, as we all, alas, know, is our country's nightmare du jour. My mother's family came to America from Sicily in the early 20th century, not long after William and Henry James, those masters of New England respectability, defined not just Sicilians, but all Italians as black criminals. We did, and to be sure, I grew up in the mid 20th century surrounded by all too many jokes about Sicilian mafiosi. To this day, I dislike watching the Godfather movies, and in point of fact, I have never seen the whole of the very first one, which I understand it's a good movie, but. <laughs> so musing on our immigration crisis, our current one, in which Mexicans and Central Americans are defined as rapists, just as Italians, but especially Sicilians, were considered mafiosi, I'll read my first identity politics poem from the 70s, dedicated to all refugees and immigrants everywhere. Uh, and I think in a, in a sense it was the first poem that I, that I wrote that came really from my heart, that came from saying, thinking something that was not something that I thought I should think in poetry. I had always been thinking poetically in poetry, but this was different. So this is a poem called Mafioso, from the 70s. Frank Costello eating spaghetti in a cell at San Quentin. Lucky Luciano mixing up a mess of bullets and calling for Parmesan cheese. Al Capone baking a sawed-off shotgun into a huge lasagna. Are you my uncles, my only uncles? 
O oh, mafiosi, bad uncles of the barren cliffs of Sicily, was it only you that they transported in barrels like pure olive oil across the Atlantic? Was it only you who got out at Ellis Island with black scarves on your heads and cheap cigars and no English and a dozen children? No carts were waiting, gallant with paint. No little donkeys plumed like the dreams of peacocks. Only the evil eyes of a thousand buildings stared across at the echoing debarkation center, making it seem so much smaller than a piazza. Only a half dozen Puritan millionaires stood on the wharf, in the wind colder than the impossible snows of the Abruzzi, ready with country clubs and dynamos to grind the organs out of you. Well, I want to thank you all for caring about borders, frontiers, refuges, and refugees. And most of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to be speaking to you today and thanking you for this extraordinary Fred Cody Prize. Sandra, thank you so much for sharing the poem and for um, sharing your incredible career with us. <laughs> My friends, we have reached the end of our program. Well, the good news is that um, we now have a reception and again, that's going to be in the Latino slash Hispanic community room, which is on this level across the lobby. And I'm going to put in yet another plug for all of the books of all these incredible authors, which are available in the lobby, um, partly because the amount of work and the amount of beauty that is in these books um, is something that we should all celebrate and that we should support. And also partly because proceeds from the sales go benefit the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library and through their generosity, these awards. Also, the authors are gonna be glad to sign the books for you, so please walk up to them, don't be shy. Um, when you buy a book and have them sign it, you can't return it. So authors are really excited to sign those for you. Okay, thank you and see you next year.